Thank, thanks very much. It's a great honour and privilege to be here. I'm delighted to be visiting Professor Adlovatnik's school and part of this panel with my old friend Mara Arodi in the chair, one of the most distinguished practitioners in government, Michael Bowsley, and one of the most formidable scholars of government, Christopher Hood. Um, what I'd like to do is to um, start off by telling a most extraordinary story which sets the scene for the, my involvement in this. It's sort of in the slipstream of Michael Barber's work in the delivery unit. As Mara alluded to, I worked for the first quality regulator of the National Health Service and was heavily involved in a process of performance management of the English NHS, a very brutal system of star ratings which combined the systems of targets and terror and naming and shaming. But I just want to explain the story as to how that actually came about. Um, and what happened in 2000 um, was the NHS was seen to be in an absolute crisis. And a Labour peer, Lord Winston, gave an interview in the New States and saying how appalling the NHS was. Talk about experiences of elderly mother, had a dreadful time in hospital. And what this made him most was, he's a, a very famous hospital doctor, when he talked to his colleagues in the NHS, they said, well, what do you expect? It's the National Health Service. Three days later, on the 20th of January, uh, Tony Blair appeared on the Breakfast with Frost programme, which was an interview um, in which he was seeking to reassure the British public that all was well with the National Health Service. This has been described as Simon Stevens, the current Chief Executive of the NHS Management Board, as the most expensive breakfast in British history. <laughs> What happened in that interview was that the, uh, the spend on the NHS had been going up and Tony Blair indicated that if it were to continue like that it could reach the average of spend percentage of GDP of OECD countries. Now one of the people watching this interview with intense interest was Clive Smee, the Chief Economic Advisor at the Department of Health who was troubled about what Prime Ministers say in these interviews, that major policy commitments might be made that would change his Sunday. But for he, by being an experienced civil servant, saw that all these commitments were hedged around with caveats if we were to continue doing this. He turned off the television, he was fairly confident no commitment had been made, and he could look forward and relax and have lunch with his family, his daughter was there and his daughter's boyfriend was there. But a few minutes after the programme ended, the telephone went, and the Prime Minister's policy advisor on the NHS phoned up to say they'd met after the broadcast and they decided they were going to make it a policy commitment to increase spend on the NHS to raise it to the average of the OECD. And the reason they were phoning Clive was they didn't know what this number was. And they thought he would have access to the OECD database, could tell them what number this was going to be. And Clive, he's written about this in his book, actually, Speaking Truth to Power, said, well, actually, he did have the OECD database. He could know what the OECD average was. But he had a big problem, which was that they, they wanted to frame this in terms of increased spend on the NHS by 5, 6, 7% a year to take the OECD average over a period of time. And that required him to do compound interest calculations, which he was actually incapable of doing. But luckily his daughter's boyfriend had a scientific calculator that could do compound interest calculations. So the two of them sat down and worked out various scenarios. That afternoon they discussed these with the ministers involved and special advisors. They made the policy commitment and they committed themselves to increase spend on the NHS by something like 50% over seven years. Um, now, the, that set the scene because what the Blair government realised is if you can, it, it contrasts with the point Michael's saying about the period of austerity, this is a period of extraordinary growth. But if you're going to throw money at the NHS like that, you have to make sure that it does deliver, it is transformed. And um, th they issued a, a white paper called the NHS Plan, which laid out the process that became star ratings. <coughs> and what the key part of their policy change that they said there was that before if hospitals fail to meet waiting list targets we give them extra money we're now going to change the culture if you fail the chief executive faces risk of the sack and you'll be named and shamed as a failing hospital 
The other countries in the United Kingdom actually continued this policy of rewarding folk, which the Blair government said would change. And all our studies show that, in fact, the English performance has outstripped the performance of the other countries. But because I was involved in this, in September 2001, when the, September 2001, when the, the, the results had been published, I was at a meeting the Department of Health organised with the chief executive of the 12 failing hospitals in the NHS, named and shamed this first process of star rating, that were actually colloquially called the Dirty Dozen. And um, when I went to this meeting, these 12 people looked like they hadn't slept for a month. The people I knew had been physically diminished. And this had been a very brutal process they were part to, the naming and shaming the risk of the sack, Qualitative research showed it wasn't just them that actually felt this very acutely, the people who worked in that hospital. At the time, I found this a very unsavoury process to be part of, but then you saw this transformation in performance of the English NHS. And it's like the, uh, the phrase of the French admiral, that, that we, the English hang an admiral from time to time to encourage the others, and this sort of going in the NHS. Okay. But what we continue to find is that because the other countries of the UK did not undergo this process of sanctions for failure, they have consistently lagged behind the English NHS. Now the reason I mention that and start with this is that the, the accounts that we've heard are all about the technical side of delivery. Um, but my experience of being in this sense at the sharp end was that there is this brutal side to it, that if you really want to change performance, you put people through a very difficult process, you put pressure on them. And when we were doing that as a regulator, people got very angry and were very unpopular. So I just wondered, Michael, what, what you felt about this. In I mean, when you've got you know, serial failing organisations to change them around and improve performance, is a very difficult process. Thank you.